Hey folks, welcome back to Short Text 331. Today we'll continue our discussion of linear operators, and this is part two of what would probably be a three-part series. And here's our definition. A linear operator is a mapping, we call it the ma mapping here A, between two vector spaces, V and W. And what that means is that you uh, take this, uh, uh, this operator and you apply it to a vector in this space and you get a vector of the other space. And for that to be a linear mapping, a linear operator, it needs to satisfy these two properties, which are really what we call bilinearity everywhere. That is to say that if you apply your operator to a sum of two vectors in your space V, then the result of that operation is the same as if you were to apply the operator to one of the vectors and then add it to the result of applying the operator to the other vector. So you can do the sum before or you can do the sum after applying the operator and that, give you, that gives you the same result. So that's the first part of linearity. And the second part of linearity is that if you apply the operator to a constant times a vector in your space, then it's the same as if you apply the constant or multiply by that constant after applying the operator to your vector. And so we have the schematic here of uh, what the operator A does. It maps vectors in this space, V, our set of vectors, our domain if you want to another space W. Now, it's not necessarily true that uh, given all the possible vectors in our space V, we get all possible vectors in the space W. Typically, what will happen is that the vectors of V will be mapped onto a subset of the vectors in W, and that subset is called the image of A. So whatever A does to that whole set gets mapped onto the image of A, and the image of A will always be at least the zero vector. There's always going to be the zero vector, and we, we, we saw that, uh, and because zero is always mapped onto zero, so we we'll always have at least a zero, but it, and it could also be that A actually covers everything. It covers all of W. So the image of A could be those extremes or anything in between. Uh, now, A could also map not just zero onto zero, but it could map uh, another set, a bigger set that's not just the zero, vector onto zero, and that's what we call the kernel of A. So the kernel is a subset of uh, V that is mapped onto zero by A. And uh, under certain conditions, we will have also an inverse mapping, a mapping that grabs vectors from W and gets us the origin vectors of V, those that when we apply A, we get a vector in W. And we'll continue to talk about this in this, uh, in this video and, and in the next video as well. So the kernel, of A, as it turns out, it's actually a subspace of V. So uh, remember then, once again, the kernel is the set of all vectors X in V, such that A applied to X gives us zero, gives us zero vectors. So all this set kernel of A is mapped onto zero. And it's, it turns out it's a subspace. That means that it's itself a vector space, and it, but it's fully contained in V. It may just be the zero vector. It could be all of V, it could be anything in between. And, uh, but it is a subspace. That is that the addition of two vectors inside the kernel is still in the kernel. The multiplication by a constant of a vector in the kernel is still in the kernel and so on and so forth. You have all the properties of a vector space. And those are inherited by this uh, defining property of the kernel that is that is made out of vectors that are annihilated, if you want, by A. The image of A within the set W, within the space W, is also a subspace, but in this case it's a subspace of W, and it's made out of all the vectors W in the space W such that there exists an X in V for which A applied to X gives us W. Again, it's all the vectors W in the set such that there is some X that is mapped onto, uh, that is mapped to X, to, to W uh, when you apply A, a to it. Now, let's see some examples of this. These are abstract ideas. Uh, so here's a, a very, very simple example. Um, I want to say maybe almost trivial example. So suppose we have an operator A that maps uh, R3 onto R3. Remember the, the set of vectors with three components, uh, three real components. It goes from R3 to R3. So our vector space V is R3, our vector space W is R3. And, um, and here we take A to be this matrix full of zeros. Remember, we saw in a previous video that all matrices are linear operators. And, uh, and so this is completely filled with zeros. And so what that means is that when you apply this A to any vector, you're going to get zero. And so the image of A is just 
the set zero because whatever you do, whatever vector you apply this to is always going to give you zero. So the image of A is just a zero vector contained in W. On the other hand, by the same token and for the same reason that A applied to any vector whatsoever in R3 gives you zero, it means that the kernel of A is all of R3. So this is an extreme case. And of course, it's just a vanishing, uh, completely vanishing uh, um, operator. It's a zero operator. Whatever you apply this to will get you zero. If you enjoyed this vector, uh, uh, this, <laughs> this vector space of videos, this video so far, um, you know, please like and subscribe. And uh, 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 you can contact me at shorttakes331 at gmail.com if you're looking for a tutor in physics or, or in math, uh, in English or in Spanish. Um, so this, this, there's another example that's interesting that uh, moves away from this uh, uh, really uh, trivial and null, uh, um, null operator example. That is uh, uh, this example of mapping between complex space with two components, so Z2 and the space of complex numbers. So here then our vector space V of, of origin where we are, to which we apply uh, our operator is C2 and, and our space, our target space is just the, the space of complex numbers. And so in this case, then let's assume that our operator just for the sake of this example is this matrix of one row and two columns uh, and then the components are one and I. And what is the kernel of this operator? What is the image of this operator? And to figure that out, we imagine applying this uh, matrix, which really looks like a vector, like a, like a, just like a row vector. We imagine applying that to a vector of components Z1 and Z2. So a generic vector in our complex space of, uh, of two component uh, objects. And so, so when you do that, you get, of course, the one times Z1 plus I times Z2 and, uh, and that's of course z1 plus i z2. Now remember z1 and z2 are complex numbers, so they themselves are real, have real and imaginary parts. So in here, hidden in z2, there's two parts, the real and imaginary parts, and the same here, each of the, each, in here in z2, there's a real and an imaginary part. So any complex number u can actually be reached by this result. If you take z1 to be that complex number u and z2 to be zero, then, then you're set. Then you can easily then find a vector such that when applying A to that vector, you get any number on the complex plane that you want and in the complex number U. And so that tells us that the image of A is the whole set of complex numbers. So in this case, the image of A then is the whole set W, the whole space of complex numbers. Now, what about the kernel of A? Let's, let's see, if we take this result that we got here and we force it to be zero, then we will find the condition satisfied by the vectors that are in the kernel of A because we're forcing it to be zero. That's the definition of the kernel. And so of course the result is simply that Z1 plus IC2 is zero or that Z1 is equal to minus I Z2. And that tells you that the kernel of A is made out of those vectors in uh, the comp, it should say C2 by the way. It says those vectors in C2 such that uh, uh, their components are minus I Z2 and Z2 in the bottom. And so you see it's a whole set of vectors inside our C2 vector space. Now, of course, zero is, of course, in the kernel of A. Zero is always in the kernel of A, and you can see that right away. If I put zero, zero here, I get zero. So, of course, the zero is always in there. I just take Z2 equals zero, and I'm there. But also, for example, minus I1 is in the kernel of A. So, there's a non-vanishing vector that's in the kernel of A uh, that results from taking Z2 equal to one. And what this tells us is that the A inverse is not well-defined because if you apply... Uh, if you if you uh, apply a to zero, you get zero. If you apply a to minus i one, you get zero. And so the inverse relation, the inverse function, uh, uh, it is not is not well defined. So if I if I wonder where do I come back to, well, if my result was zero, I don't know. I, maybe I came from zero. Maybe I came from minus i one. And so the reverse trip coming from w to v is not well defined. Coming from in our diagram from here to here, I don't know, I wouldn't know where to go. So my result was zero, do I go to zero? Do I go to minus I1, I, which one is it? Well, it's not well defined for the reasons that we just saw. And so in this case, this, this, um, this operator A defined like this does not have a well-defined inverse. Here's another example, which does have a well-defined inverse and we're gonna work it out. So suppose we have then this operator B that maps 
the uh, R, space R2 to the space R2 to itself, and the B is given by the simple matrix with, which we worked with before. So there's a matrix one, two, three, four, and we can ask what's the kernel of B? Well, let's see. We take B, we apply it to a generic vector, and we get this result. And now we force the result to be zero. We really want the result to be zero because that's what defines the kernel. And we're going to find from there a condition on x1 and x2. If we force that to be zero, it means that the first equation here, this first expression has to be zero. That gives us x1 equals to minus 2x2. And when, then we have also a second equation that tells us 3x1 plus 4x2 has to be equal to zero. I should have written here more carefully 0, 0, a 0, 0 vector. And, and, uh, and the result of that is that x1 is equal to x2 is equal to zero. There's no way to satisfy the two equations that result uh, unless both x1 and x2 are zero, because it cannot be that x1 is minus two times x2 and also minus four thirds of x2. And so it must be that they're both zero. So that tells us that the kernel now is just trivial. It's just a zero vector. So that's pretty good. Let's see about the image of B. So we want to apply B to a vector and get B1 and B2. Is it possible to find x1 and x2 for any vector B1, B2 whatsoever? For that, we would have to solve the linear system for generic, uh, uh, generic values of B1 and B2, for any B1 and B2. And we saw that that is possible to do, and that is possible to find a unique solution if the determinant of B is non-zero. We saw in a previous video that if the determinant of B is non-zero, then you're safe. Then you can uh, find expressions for X1 and X2 in terms of B1 and B2 and the components of B, that is one, two, three, four, and then you're safe. That solution is well-defined and it's unique. Well, we calculate the determinant then, and the determinant is one times four minus three times two. So that's four minus six, that's minus two, and that's different from zero, so we're safe. So then we know that the inverse of B is well-defined, but we haven't found it, we just found the determinant. Okay, so what is that inverse? Where's that inverse operator? Let's try, let's try to find it. So the inverse, if you recall, is defined by uh, this condition that B times the inverse is the identity matrix. B times the inverse is one is what defines our B inverse, the, or the inverse of the operator B. Okay, so let, let's let's set up that equation. So we have one, two, three, four, the other side matrix B, our operator B, and now we have this generic form for B inverse, x1, y1, x2, y2. I just used some generic variables here. And then the right-hand side is one, zero, zero, one, that's the identity matrix of size two by two. And that gives us two systems of equations with uh, 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 two by two and two by two. So we have four unknowns, we have four unknowns. And the way I wrote this here is that I took this matrix I multiply by the first column and I set it equal to the first column of the result. And then I took the first, this matrix once again and multiply by the second column and set it equal to the second column. And that gave me these two systems of two equations each with two unknowns each. And so this is what I would call system one and this is what I call system two. And the way to solve it is by the way, we've solved systems of equations before and there's a number of ways to do that. And here I'll take this opportunity to tell you about yet another way to solve this problem which actually uh, transfers to larger systems of equations as well, with some caveats that numerically could be very difficult to do this for very, very large systems. But for two by two, two by two or three by three, you can use what's called Kramer's rule. And that rule tells you that if you know how to calculate determinants, then you know how to do this, there's no problem. So Kramer's rule tells you that to calculate X1, you have to take the first column of your matrix that was one, two, three, four, and replace it by the first column by the column of the result, so one zero. So we put the one zero here, and then we take that determinant. So instead of one, two, three, four, we have one zero, two, four, and we take that determinant, that gives us four, and then we divide by the determinant of the matrix, by the determinant of B. And so that four divided by the determinant of B, the determinant of B is minus two, but I just left it expressed here as the determinant of B. And, uh, and for X2, you play the same game, but instead of replacing one zero and on the first column, you replace it on the second column. And so one, three, one zero is what we have for x2. And so we take this determinant and we get 1, 0, minus uh, 3, 1. There should be a minus sign here, by the way, and, uh, and divide by the determinant of b. And so once you have that, then, um, then, then you, you, you have uh, the final answer. And so, and so this should, with the caveat that there should be a minus sign here, you get then x1 is 4 determinant of b, x2 is minus 3 determinant of b, and you repeat the same process for 2 and you obtain y1 and y2. And so once you have that, then you have the inverse. The inverse will be the one over the determinant of B times whatever result you got by solving this problem for, uh, like X, for X1 and X2, like we just did, or for Y1 and Y2. 
And so the result is what I wrote here, again, with the caveat that there should be a minus three here and there should be a minus three. So, so and, and we, I wrote explicitly one over the determinant of B, which is a, a minus two, so, so there, there will be then a minus one half in front. And that's how you find the inverse. That's how you find the inverse of a, a, uh, a two by two matrix. And you can use the same approach, Kramer's rule for a three by three system, but then beyond that, it gets very complicated and perhaps numerically expensive because it turns out that calculating these determinants for larger matrices, as we will see in a future video, requires a very large number of operations. So it's something you want to use sparingly or you want to use, you want to be careful when you uh, invoke that kind of operation. Finally, another example of, of an operator and trying to find an inverse of an operator, something a bit more interesting, is the case of a differential operator. And so let's imagine the, of t taking this um, derivative operator uh, which operates on some space of functions uh, and it maps the result uh, onto some other space of functions. So, so these functions in V would have to be functions that are differentiable, of course, so we can be safe in applying the derivative. Uh, so imagine that they are. And so we set up then our, our equation in this way. So imagine we have this system, this, this uh, system of equations, this one equation where uh, we have our operator A, which is the derivative, we have our vector, which is a function that we want to know, we want to find out, and we have our right-hand side, which is a given vector here that's uh, set to be minus 2x. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the inverse of differentiation is integration, of course. And so our function f of x will be the integral evaluated at x of minus 2x prime dx prime. I use prime here to denote that it's a different variable from, from x. The x is where you evaluate the result plus some constant. So this, if you want, is, is what one might call the antiderivative. It's, it's an indefinite integral, and you, you evaluate it at x, but you have to add a constant because you really don't know once you take once you differentiate the integral what this constant might be. And so, so when you differentiate this constant, you get zero. And so any function of this form, minus x squared plus x plus c, then is going to be a valid function that is a solution to this problem. But this also gives us uh, some pause, right? This, this presents a bit of trouble. So that means there is no well-defined inverse for our operator ddx, because if uh, this is our right-hand side and we want to put the operator ddx on the other side, then there has to be a well-defined f that, that uh, our, our inverse maps this to. And, and there isn't a well-defined f. The f is defined up to a constant. That constant, we don't know what it is. So any constant gives us the f dx equals minus 2x. So we need to add another condition to make this a well-defined inverse. This is very common, especially in physics, and this comes from typically initial conditions or, or boundary conditions. There's usually something else in the problem that tells you what you need to do to find your well-defined unique solution that results from applying the inverse operator. And again, the inverse operator is really solving the problem. It's solving the differential equation. It's what we're doing here. We're trying to find f such that its derivative is equal to this right-hand side that was given to us. So we're solving a differential equation. Now, that differential equation will require typically, again, initial conditions or boundary conditions or something else. And here we, we pull this condition out of our heads just to fix ideas. Uh, we say f of 0 is equal to 1. Let's set that as part of the problem, or we could define it as part of the space also. The problem might be find a solution to this equation in the space of functions that are differentiable and that f of z is such that the functions evaluated at zero give you one. That may very well be set by the problem. And so if that's true, if that's if that's our condition, then, then our set of functions is f of x equals to, I mean, the result is f of x equals to minus x squared plus one, because if you evaluate uh, this function at zero, it's equal to, it is equal to one, that sets the constant and then we're safe. And then this, the inverse, is, is well defined. And what is the inverse operator? It's the integral operator plus the one here. Okay, that would be, that would be the, uh, the, the one way to think about the inverse operator. And we'll elaborate more on inverse operators and, and inverses of differential operators in future videos when we talk about Green's functions and such, which are, which are really at the core of defining inverses of differential operators. And more generally, if you're given this problem, the f dx equals to g of x, where g of x is, is any generic function, not just minus two x, you would do the same thing. You would say, well, then f of x is this integral plus some constant. And uh, if you want to implement this uh, this boundary or initial condition that f evaluated at some point a is some value f0, uh, again, this could be part of the problem or it could be part of the operator, which could be the same thing, then uh, then the, the, uh, the constant would be f0 minus that antiderivative, that indefinite integral evaluated at a. And so in that way, 
you you obtain that uh, um, that f of x is the, uh, the 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 integral between a and x of g of x prime dx prime plus f of zero. And so of course when you evaluate x at a, the integral part disappears and you're just left with f zero as you're supposed to. And that's the last example. And uh, we'll continue this discussion of linear operators in part three. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If you're looking for a tutor in physics or math and you're not a student at UNC, then maybe I can help you. You can send me a message uh, and find me at shorttakes331 at gmail.com or you can leave a message in the comment section below and I'll get back to you. And that's all. Until next time.